Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshiks mainframe channel. This is Moshiks. In the beginning there was nothing. And it was good. There was no internet. There was no international network. There was no global network. And people couldn't hack your credit card or steal your information from the Marriott hotel chain. Like we just got informed today. Today, we just got news that the Marriott Hotel has had a data breach where 500 million guests had their names, password numbers, mailing addresses, some credit cards as well, stolen. So as I said, in the beginning there was nothing and it was good. Uh, later on, an, an IBM, a, a company we know well called IBM invented the first network, the predecessor in a way of the internet not architecturally but it was at the time before the internet that this was the largest network global network on earth and uh, what this was is IBM uh, created a way to connect um, mainframes with each other and um, and they did that through either lease links like lease lines from the from the telecom companies or through dial-up sometimes and even uh, channel to channel would be used sometimes. And funny enough, the first uh, machines that were connected with each other were actually not MVS systems, they were VM systems, VM 370s and VM uh, SP, as you can see here. It was first deployed as a private host to host network among VM 370 mainframes around or oh, before 1975. Uh, somebody, one of the main developers in Cambridge of uh, UK, uh, the US, of of um, VM370 sat down and wrote uh, RSCS, which is Remote Spooling and Communication Subsystem, as you can see here. And it's a virtual machine uh, that contains a, a communication protocol so that um, files can be received and sent and messages can be received and sent. Based on from this very humble beginning, uh, they were able also to later on to expand to networking through remote job entry with MVS and other mainframe operating systems. Um, even even DEC uh, VMS had a way to connect to VNet. Uh, pretty soon, uh, as you can see here, by September 1979, the network had grown to 285 mainframes uh, connected to each other, a good part of them within IBM, but also outside, uh, within Europe, Asia, and, and, the, and North America, Canada, and the US. Um, so in the VNet architecture, so they called it VNet, IBM VNet. And I guess they called VNet because of VM370, really, mainly. Uh, at the time, as you, as you remember, IBM started to call everything V. Uh, VTAM, VSAM, everything was virtual because they had just, they were so happy they had invented uh, um, or, or in, introduced in their own architecture the uh, virtual memory concepts that they couldn't stop themselves from, uh, from calling everything virtual. Uh, so the unlike the internet, where you have a point-to-point -point communication where I send you an email, it goes from my email server to your email server. Um, VNet switches files, means that it, it it routes files among mainframes using a store and forward technique. So that if I, if, if I was on mainframe A and you were on mainframe C, and both of us would only have a connection to mainframe B, then mainframe B would act as a store and forward server. Obviously, security then was not at all a, uh, a, a big concern. Um, nowadays, we wouldn't want any other server to store our information before it's being sent on to somebody else. Of course, routers do that, but they do that at the packet level, not at the file level. Um, but And so, uh, this is how May VNet worked. Uh, many of the kind of connections, as I said, were over dial-up lines. Um, this was done with an IBM device called, a modem called 2703. Um, and very low speeds, up to, you know, up to 2400 beats or baud per second. Um, and uh, later on, a link was introduced between uh, the US and Europe. And the files at the time were very small. Could be a message, could be just a file of a few hundred, of, few, of a line of one record, 80 bytes, or, or just very small files. And so when you sent uh, somebody, user, at, at a certain host a file, it would take at best you know, minutes, at best whenever that host, that mainframe connected again. It could be hours, it could be days. Um, 
And so files were just delivered on a hop to hope basis, so they would keep on hopping between mainframes until they would uh, arrive. Um, they even wrote and have email applications where you could send emails between those machines, which is not nothing to do with the SMTP protocol that we use today. Um, pretty soon, this was the biggest network in the world. And by the way, the very first uh, computer worm, they don't really exist in this form nowadays anymore, but um, the first worm was, a, was actually on VNet, which was a, an, a Rex um, file called Christmas tree, which would uh, be executed on every host and show a Christmas tree because it was on Christmas in 1987, so 31 years ago. And it spread over and uh, all over the VNet. At the time, it had several thousand uh, uh, machines, uh, several thousand hosts. And the creator was this person at IBM called Edson Hendricks. Oops, the site cannot be reached. But um, this is how it was done back then. Now. Uh, since this is in a way a very a very um, primitive protocol it's been my dream for at least three years and I know it's been a dream for some other people to reintroduce VNet and create our own network just like the people at uh, in the open VMS camp did with their uh, hacknet hacknet open VMS and I have actually done <laughs> this is funny because it just shows my video here I, do, I am a member of that network as well, HECnet. It's a, it's a hobbyist network for DECnet, the IBM VMS networking protocol. You can, get, uh, uh, and you can get a host number there and, and then you can connect there. And you should probably see what on my host here somewhere. Um, yeah, so uh, where is it? Well, I, I have at least six or seven hosts on this network and I have a whole video uh, that shows uh, how I connected to it this video which I think is video um, M31 so in that one I showed and so my my dream has been to cre recreate something like they have for the VMS open VMS and other decknet uh, arc, uh, operating systems to do it for our mainframe and so we could start sharing files and information and even have potentially a mailing list on um, on on this uh, on this architecture now I, i'm not the only one who's been playing with this idea because recently in the vm370 forums for hercules somebody released a a how-to on how to connect vm370s with each other using the 2703 um, the IBM 2703 is a modem. Of course, it's not being sold anymore, but uh, where can we see? Yeah, so 2703 uh, was a start stop synchronous communication line. And the, the good thing is that Hercules actually supports the 2701, 2703 devices uh, by emulating them over TCP IP connections um, on demand. And so it's a very, the 2703 is a, is a great uh, protocol to connect to VM370 as on demand. So that if I have a VM370 host and I want to connect another VM370 host, then it would dial up that host and that host would receive the call. And it actually shows a ring, ring in the, in the Hercules log files. And then it answers and you can upload files or send a message. Um, unfortunately, um, VM370 as we know it, however, doesn't have a routing uh, the RSCS in VM370 as, um, that we use on uh, on Hercules doesn't have any routing protocol. Um, that came with VM slash SP, uh, which is a more modern uh, version of uh, of Hercules of um, of VM, and that has the routing capability. However, that is of course uh, off limits because it's not uh, in the public domain, and so. Um, and that we're kind of uh, we're kind of shut out of that. Um, we can't really use that. So, um, but we have a, I, we got it working. Me and the gentleman in Japan I got it working, and we have our hosts connected uh, this way. And this is going to produce a video pretty soon on how to connect VM three seventies uh, directly with each other using the twenty seven hundred three dial up modem emulation of Hercules. 
Uh, today, however, I'm going to show another approach to recreate HNet, which is not complete yet. So we're that's why I call it part one, because we don't really have it. Um, we don't have it working on a big scale yet, but we have it working uh, on a simple level um, using the um, uh, Hercules channel-to-channel -channel adapter uh, released by Peter Jennings. Uh, uh, Hercules C2C. In the Hercules C2C, you can create a channel-to-channel -channel, uh, configuration, um, which was the same as the IBM 3088 device. IBM had once uh, made a device called the IBM 3088 channel to channel adapter which would take two channels from one from mainframe from mainframe A and the other one from mainframe B and it would plug into the IBM 3088 device and then it would switch between them kind of like the no modern serial cable. Um, and so we, um, this gentleman in Japan, Lee and myself, have, have got it working and I'm going to show it today. Um, and I'm also going to show you how to get uh, Hercules configured. The one caveat is that we don't have it working with VM370 because VM370 doesn't have um, channel to channel adapter support. Um, so we have to use something which is a little bit older, which is, uh, I, uh, which is, I uh, can show it here, new session. We use uh, VM ESA, a very, very old version from the mid 90s. Uh, release 2.4 and we adapted enough to make this work with uh, with this uh, release of VM3 of uh, VMESA. Now before the license uh, watchman in the community starts screaming I did buy um, IBM cards you see here this is an IBM P390 card that uh, fits into a a PC that's powered by IBM OS2 and uh, those are basically um, P390 processors they're able to execute VMESA, OS390, uh, VSE slash ESA uh, so, so those are 31-bit uh, processors and, um, and in fact I have two of those and so um, that's why I feel entitled to run uh, VM ESA here in my case okay uh, just saying but these are wonderful cards they're very nicely engineered uh, look at this uh, gold contacts and um, they don't have a whole lot of RAM but they do have daughter cards that increase the RAM or the storage in mainframe parlance to 64 megabytes which is enough to run VM ESA of course and early versions of OS 390 so I bought them uh, actually last year I've had them for about a year wonderful cards now, how do you how you get it to work, uh, and what machine you need to uh, be able to be allowed to run this operating system is up to you. I'm only showing how we got it to work. There is, um, I do own a um, a uh, uh, one of those cards um, that you can attach to a to a uh, R six thousand that gives you the instruction set. I actually own two of those cards. So that kind of gives you entitlement. Um, so, um, and I'll show them in one of my next videos. I'll show those cards, the big cards, with uh, with uh, I think 64 megabytes of RAM or 128, and you can run um, you can run uh, mainframe operating systems on those. So uh, I have here VM ESA, and as you can see here, we have a channel to channel connection. Um, this is my. RSCS. I can, I'm logged in here as RSCS, the user, and I can show you here that I have RSCS Q system. It will show that we have a link to a host in Japan uh, ongoing here, um, and the status is connected. It's a network job entry. This is the device that I use for that, and the link is up. So I could, for instance, now say RSCS message Tanmatsu and I'm logged here here on the same machine as user uh, Moshix as you can see here at the same host so I can now say Moshix hello from from the USA as you can see here this is in Japan now completely different host 
and I just got the message. And uh, it goes, of course, both ways. So I can say um, you have to since this is the command uh, RSCS can only be used by RSCS if you are logged in as RSCS. If you're logged in as somebody else, I don't know if you have the permit. If I have the uh, right. Um, the right uh, permissions to do that, but I can try our RSCS. So send, I think it's send message to user RSCS on this machine, and then you tell it the command that you want to run. Uh, I can see hnet g. Uh, you can see it came from hnet g. Um, RSCS hello back from Japan. Yes, and <laughs> as you can see here, it worked. So we have these two machines connected over a channel to channel adapter. And by the way, Hercules uh, emulates a channel to channel adapter quite well. It's not ideal in the sense there is no, if the, if the connection drops, um, then obviously there is no error recovery whatsoever right now in Peter Jennings uh, channel to channel adapter code emulation within Hercules. So I know that he is, he has told me that he's, he has an intention to work on that a little, a little bit again so it is able to pick up the connection again if it drops and do some error recovery. Uh, right now it's still you need to have a very reliable TCP IP connection between the two hosts uh, which we happen to have. This has been up now for I think about a week and it's very reliable. Um, so now for instance I can so remember this is the host in Japan because it says here Moshiks at this host Hong Matsu and this is my RSCS host. So I can also send messages. This is my main user, user ID. I main at host hnetg. So I can do, for instance, now as message. Let's first edit a file. X moshix hnet a. And we say hello Japan. This is Moshix mainframe channel greetings and peace. We file this. So it's called Moshix HNet. Okay. So now we can send this file over uh, to to uh, Japan by doing a series of commands and uh, there, in, it's a little bit it's a little bit it will look a little bit weird to you because these are commands that most people don't know on, on uh, VM, but you can tag um, when you never you, you, you print something or punch something, you can attach a tag to that in VM. And you do that by saying tag, tag device, punch, tan matsu, and moshix. So now everything is gonna be tagged with host tan matsu and user moshix, and that is done. And then I can say spool punch, to RSCS because it's RSCS. Remember, there's a service virtual machine within this host here called RSCS, which carries all the all the work of sending and receiving files. This is this machine here. So we need to send now the file that we want to send for processing to this RSCS service virtual machine. So I do this pool uh, spool punch to RSCS, and then I do a disk dump of Moshix HNet A, um, and this should now, yes. Oh, this was actually very fast. If you if you think about it, this is the other side of the globe. They just this just traveled about I don't know, fifteen thousand miles, um, and so I just send this file over with this command disk dump. I just dumped the the file, but to I spooled it to punch and punch goes punch card goes to user RSCS. I'm sure we got also a notification here, yes. Uh, three records. And and then we tagged it with uh, this host and this and this user. So RSCS is able to to do the routing. And that's the one thing that we don't have in VM370. There's no way to route between hosts. So if I had now 50 hosts attached to this server here, to this VM ESA, uh, with channel-to-channel -channel adapters, it would it would know how to route between the various mainframes attached to it, and that's the beauty of it. So um, now we have a read card.
what is the file number uh, here it is receive okay so it's here now so now we can do x moshix hnet Hello Japan, this is Moshik's mainframe channel, greetings and peace. So this is the file that we sent from here, if you remember just a minute ago, and it has arrived. Uh, and now I could send it back from here to any user that I know of. So uh, I need to know wh what is the username at what host. In a way, it's almost like sending an email to, let me say, Moshix at gmail.com. You need to know which host is processing the email from for user Moshix. And it would be the same thing here uh, in this architecture where you need to know at which host at which mainframe a user has an account to be able to send them files or messages but it does work it's very reliable and I can show you some of the commands so you can see um, what how to manage this so RSCS is the let's make this a little bigger now now that I showed you how to use it let's see how it works so RSCS Q query system it will show, oh, let's say like this, we show that we have this connection, connection to this host. If I had another 50 hosts here, they would all show up. And the scalability is there, so we could easily do um, uh, 100 hosts or so. Uh, we haven't tried 100, but if the processing requirement is so low, I'm sure it can be done. Um, then we, see, we said, query files show full. So I want to see what's going on. So no files are being transferred right now. I could also show progress. Okay, now I can also say drain tanmatsu. And so this is how I deactivate the link. So if I now do RCS Q system, the link is now inactive. I can easily restart it uh, with RSCS um, start tanmatsu. This could all be also automated with a rec scripts. Um, and now, yeah, and now it's active again. So we can test it again. If I do s message rcs to send a message to Tanmatsu Moshix, link is up again, I think. So let's get out of here. And no connect path is currently available. So okay, so that's interesting. So we're learning something here. There's some problem. The link s message rscs uses. Yeah, it's inactive. So I don't know if we have the rights to restart it. This is this is not my machine. Um, start hnmg. It's a restricted command. So I would have to ask the person in Japan to restart it. So I'm just texted him on WhatsApp and um, hopefully it's gonna be up again and then we can try this again. So I don't know if there's error recovery. I don't think that it will try again to send this message. So this is just almost like chat, either goes through or it doesn't. Um, but um, we can try our CSQ system in a while, and then we'll see if the link could come up again. So if you drop it on one end, if you, if you drain the connection on one end, you will also, of course, go down on the other end, and then both have to restart it. But I, I'm sure this could be automated so that um, both sides could try to, uh, every couple of minutes, to restart a link if it's down. Um, this could be done very easily in Rex. So um, this just shows a little bit on uh, on what it means to uh, to work with these connections. Now let's go back to uh, who am I here? Q user ID. Okay, so let's go back to RSCS and let's and uh, let's IPL 
Um, this file. Yeah, we need to IPL CMS. So that we have uh, editor an editor environment. And file list. Okay, so what are the configuration steps to get this done? It's actually quite easy. Um, I can say, okay, so let's look at this file. Well, I, I don't like the, how it's representing it. Let me do this like this, XRS config. Uh, it's lap, wrapping the lines around, but um, you can see here there's um, a lot of stuff you don't actually have to worry about and then we start to have the route command so this is where you, the configuration that you need to put in for route between links everything is routable here it, by the way this has LU name because this is also where of VTAM so this could also do VTAM uh, connections and at some point here we have our own definition where is it here Uh, oh yeah here it is so link define uh, tanmatsu type network uh, Job, network uh, job entry. This is the device it uses and the node name. And then um, there's a secret password which both have to share. And, um, and I'm going to change it after this video so don't even try guys. <laughs> but uh, uh, this is uh, really the, all there is. There's really not that much. And, And uh, what else is the profile GCS? So let's look at X profile GCS. Yeah, this starts RSCS. So you obviously need to start RSCS um, to be able to uh, run any of these commands. And uh, there's really this is really all there is to it. Once you have a channel to channel device uh, configured and by the way of course VM ESA does auto sensing of devices you don't need to go and change the IO definition for the uh, control program for the nucleus and I'm sure that a lot of the people here understand what I'm saying to maybe to some people it's not really clear um, but uh, this is how uh, easy it is to configure we're gonna this is just part one where I'm just going to show in general that uh, in, in in HNet for the mainframe community is possible um, that we do have a central node run in VM ESA that does can do the routing and we're still experimenting with it we're going to show some more videos about it but as you can see here we have we have a very simple network between two hosts uh, already up and running and uh, let me see here if this is already up no he hasn't uh, he hasn't received my message yet but he will do it at some point. Uh, but the links are up so very stable. I mean, this has been up for about a week, the link. It's, today is the first time I'm taking it down. Um, and so we can send files, we can share files with each other. Uh, it increases productivity quite a bit because you don't have to worry about doing a file transfer, receiving it, uh, just like Professor René Fernand did in the previous video, M101. Uh, you would have to receive it, send it by email, then upload it again. This is the natural way to share uh, files between users on the mainframe is to is to uh, send to each other. The other thing we can do very easily is also uh, have um, MBS um, attached to this uh, network job, job entry because uh, JS2 has NGA capability. And in fact, um, TK4 MBS TK4 has already an network job entry lines defined. So we could easily add them here and then send also jobs from here directly to any uh, mainframe that's connected. Um, there's a password needs to be shared, a secret, but um, once we have that, that's, um, that's all up and running very simply. So all we wanted to do here in this video is to show that it is, it is possible and it does work. 
um, everything could be a little bit easier and better but once you open up the possibilities to people then people start to get creative and create new innovation and, and enable solutions on top and so that's all we wanted to show that it's possible and we're also going to show a video where we network vm 370s uh, together with uh, 2703 uh, modern devices over tcp ip and that as i said is a bit restricted because there is no routing of uh, of uh, packages it's only strictly one-to-one -one. whereas in our case uh, my vm esa could be the central node uh, in the HNet because it, it, it is able to route and so it could route between machines it could almost be like a star configuration because this machine is always going to be up and down running 24 7 so anybody who wants to connect to it can can connect to it and then we could start sharing information uh, with each other and um, and almost like a star network topology where this is the central node and everybody would then connect to it and receive the files or send the files and could then uh, drain the connection again and move on. Uh, I wish we could do this with 2703s because it's a very elegant solution to have dial up, but unfortunately, VM ESA doesn't support 2703 modem devices anymore. So uh, we have this kind of problem. We could probably uh, write a device driver for it because Hercules is able to uh, work with 2703s, but um, that is a little bit above my pay grade. I wouldn't know how to do it. I think I just got a message that we got it enabled again. Yes. <laughs> you just sent me a text message. You just heard the uh, WhatsApp message. And uh, I, I kind of knew it was him. So the link is up again. And um, and uh, I can also do it from here. I'm not authorized. So uh, I would have to go in here and do log off. Then reconnect. Okay. Uh, just start from that too. Okay. Active. So we got the lines restored. So that's it. Um, this is just a very, very short, very simple taste of what is possible with uh, with RSCS uh, and with uh, and uh, with channel to channel adapters. I will continue to explore if it's possible to have somehow 2703 modem support to re put in again in uh, VM ESA because it will make a lot of things much easier. But uh, uh, sign on from yeah. Just got a message. So we are we are connected again. Here. Yeah, fully connected again. So uh, we have the the I want to say the the seed of an of an H net of a of a Hercules net uh, already running between at least between two nodes on two different continents. It is reliable. It's very easy to configure. Uh, this uh, just shows you that it is possible. I let it up to your imagination to to think of where we can take this. But um, but uh, but here it is for now, and I hope you enjoyed this very first taste of HNet. If you like this particular video and the work that uh, this gentleman in Japan, uh, a very special gentleman in Japan, has put in, uh, then please press on the thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to the Moshix Mainframe channel yet, then please do so now to receive notifications of future videos. And I see you soon again for part two. Thank you. Bye.